Okay. Um, now this is the wrong, this is, this is not part one, this is part two. You can just fire me after this. <laughs> Let's go ahead and pray uh, because I think I'm going to need it. <laughs> Lord, thank you uh, so much uh, just for today. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. Thank you for your mercy and for your wisdom. Pray, God, that this would be beneficial and that uh, overall, Lord, you would be glorified. Uh, we thank you so much for it's in your son's name. Amen. Okay. Let's uh, do a quick review real real fast here of what we talked about last week, and then uh, we will go into answering uh, the three questions that I had asked last week. I kind of left you guys on a cliffhanger, and we have to answer these uh, uh, in short order. Uh, first, we talked about coalesced thinking process, using the phrase the mind, right, or heart, as it's translated, the Hebrew word lab. This is not talking about the physical heart that's within our chest, but this is talking about uh, the function and activity of the spirit. That is the mind that is found within that spirit, the particular function of that, the understanding. Koaleth is using his mind to uh, do this particular activity. We also talked about Koaleth's intentional observations um, with the word test. I will test you with pleasure right? Um, this is not a happenstance or an accidental type activity. This is something that, that, that Coalesce is doing personally and intentionally. Um, we see also, too, in Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 2, verse 1, the examination of the personal consistent satisfaction in life. That is the word for pleasure, okay? Should a, per should a individual live for this particular goal or this activity? And then we looked at the philosophical perspective of hedonism, and we had concluded looking at all of the various aspects of hedonism. Remember, when we see the word ism, we are talking about a worldview, a comprehensive set of beliefs regarding pleasure, right? Uh, enhancing pleasure and avoiding pain, whether it be an individual or society at large, right? And then the last one is the conclusion of Coalesce's naturalistic observations, right? He uh, gives us the uh, kind of the, 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 uh, the conclusion of all of his study, and he concludes that it is, it is useless, it is vanity, right? It is a futility. Okay? So let's uh, go ahead and review these uh, questions here. The first question is, what does the following statement about laughter mean? He says this in verse two. I said of laughter, it is madness. And of pleasure, what does it accomplish, right? Uh, what does it mean? Does it mean that we have to walk around stoic all the time? Um, what does this particular uh, uh, phrase mean for, for Koala? Two, what was his activity? What exactly did he do? How, what, how did exactly, how exactly did he observe? And what were his conclusions? How did, and why does he come to this conclusion? And then third, does Koalef believe that pleasure is bad or is uh, not sound? Let's go ahead and uh, begin in verse two, th looking at the word uh, laughter. And we're going to answer this first question here. He said, I said of laughter, it is madness. And of pleasure, what does this accomplish? Right? We will examine the word in red here that has been translated laughter. Sehoke is the word here for laughter in the Hebrew text. This word occurs 15 times in the scriptures. Okay? And it occurs in the book of Ecclesiastes four times. Okay? This word describes a person, place, or thing, hence it is a noun, right, in the Hebrew language. Let's go ahead and examine this book throughout Ecclesiastes and see what we can come up with, okay? The, uh, the second usage is found in chapter 7, verse 3 of the book of Ecclesiastes, okay? And when we get here, I, I, I'm anticipating this. This is the this is uh, contrasting the house of mourning versus the house of pleasure. 
I'll start at verse one. It says a good a good name is a good name is better than good ointment, and then the day of one's death is better than the day of one's birth. For it is better to go to the house of mourning than it is to go to the house of feasting, because that is the end of every man, and the living takes it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter. For when a face is sad, a heart may be happy. And the context here of Ecclesiastes 7, just very briefly, uh, Koaleth believes that it is more advantageous to go to a funeral than it is to go to a party. Well, why would he come to that conclusion? Because at a party, um, no one thinks about their life in toto. Everybody thinks about what's going on there at the party, having fun and things like that. But when a person goes to a funeral, they take stock in their life, right? They think about how they live and, and how short life is. And so Solomon uses that to give perspective. It's also found in Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 7, verse 6. It says, for as the crackling of the thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of a fool. Now, I don't, uh, I don't know how you could tell a fool by the way that they laugh. Okay. And I wouldn't under and I wouldn't know why laughter would be considered also vanity or useless. But it is interesting how he says that the crackling of thorns under a pot. I've never done that. Um, it's a, it, I guess it's. Uh, 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 I, I, I'm not going to try that. Um, it is annoying, right? It is useless, right? And so. Uh, Saul or Koaleth, that is Solomon, makes this comparison here, that the laughter of the fool is also useless. There is one other instance where it is used, and I think that this uh, speaks to the clarity of what Koaleth was saying in chapter 2. It's found in Ecclesiastes 10, verse 19, where Koaleth is summing up kind of making some, uh, after he does all of these observations, he kind of sums up uh, his findings here. And he says this in verse 19. It says, men prepare a meal for enjoyment. This is the same word here that's used in chapter 2 um, for laughter. And wine makes life merry, and money is the answer to everything, right? So I would say that this is probably more clear it's not necessarily laughter that's, that Solomon is getting at. In this context, it's enjoyment. Men prepare a meal for enjoyment, physical sustenance, you know, company with friends, things like that. Okay? So I would say a more clear explanation of this text in uh, chapter 2 is enjoyment. So I said of enjoyment, <clears throat> it is madness, right? Not necessarily laughter. Laughter is not uh, uh, madness, so to speak, but enjoyment in the context of pleasure. Remember, the we cannot divorce this verse from the whole concept of what Solomon is trying to say. He's talking about pleasure and the result of that, right? Should men pursue pleasure for the sake of it? Is that what we're made for, right? Well, Solomon makes the conclusion is that it is madness. Halal is the uh, Hebrew word for this in verse 2. He said that this word occurs 165 times. However, this Hebrew word only occurs in the book of Ecclesiastes twice. So it's not frequently used, right? The first, we've already looked at this word before. We've already seen this word. This word occurs in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 17. Halela, right? In verse 17, it reads, again, translated madness. And I said, and I set my mind to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. And I realized that this is also a striving after the wind, okay? Now, this is a very interesting word here that, that, uh, that Kohalef uses in chapter 2. So the word halal in this sense is passive. 
It is something that happens to an individual, right? The enjoyment that one receives from pleasure, according to uh, Koheleth, is madness. It is madness. This Hebrew word is singular rather than plural. And it is also a participle, meaning the, the, the state of it. So in the broader context, putting this all together, Koala's point is discussing one's perspective or disposition regarding enjoyment. Remember, Koheleth is looking at perspective. He's looking at outlook. He's trying to answer the question, what is humanity here for? Is humanity all about pleasure? Again, we talked about this last week with hedonism, the very perspective itself, living for the sake of your own enjoyment, according to Koheleth, is madness. It is irrational. Recall this underscores a person's own existence. For a person to believe that their existence in the world is to live for their own enjoyment, whether it be an individual or a society, is in effect illogical. It doesn't make sense. This is pretty incredible because, again, we live in a culture that seems to think that living for your own self does make sense. It is logical to do. It's rational to do. And Koheleth is, if you or I or any of us have that perspective, if we were to read this, we would be deeply disappointed. And that's the point of this. Then we get to pleasure in verse two. I said of laughter, it is madness and of pleasure. What does this accomplish? Again, this is the same word that's used in the start of Ecclesiastes, simcha, okay? It's the same word, it says, I said to myself or to my, to my heart or to my mind, come now, I will test you with pleasure. And we see in verse two, that he asked the question, and of pleasure, what does this accomplish? What is it, literally? What does it do? Well, if he's asking that question, then this automatically, naturally leads us to the second question. What is his activity, and why does he come to these conclusions? Why is pleasure for the sake of itself and the perspective that we have? Why is it come up empty? Why is it illogical? Why is it rational or, or irrational? We come now to verse three of Ecclesiastes chapter two. Koheleth writes this, I explored with my mind how to stimulate my body with wine while my mind was guiding me wisely and how to take hold of folly until I could see what good there is for the sons of men under heaven, uh, the sons of men to do under heaven the few years of their lives. Remember I told you that in, a, in any type of research, you want to detail what you're doing, right? That's kind of the idea, right? So that if people want to emulate or, uh, or, or duplicate that particular study, they're able to do it. Solomon, again, using his mind, the immaterial activity of the human being. This is not like folk hedonism, where people just throw their, their, their uh, you know, caution to the wind and just decide to live it up, right? He is focused intently on this. He wants to know the findings. He's not doing this haphazardly. Wisely is the word here. Again, this is hachma. This is used in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 13, right? It says, and I set my mind to seek and explore by wisdom 
concerning all that has been done under heaven. Again, this associates itself right back to the overall purpose and intent of Solomon to examine this. His method and intention. Then we've got these particular uh, these particular phrases here. Stimulate my body with wine. This is kind of fascinating. Does this mean that he was inebriated while he was uh, while he was uh, looking at uh, these particular things? He was drunk. Well, that's not no, not really, because then that wouldn't be wise according to what he's written in Proverbs and other places. So what does he mean here? Koholes shares that he was engaged in the stimulation of his physical body with wine. Usually you have wine for enjoyment, for pleasure, right? Uh, the physical sensations, things like that. He was not inebriated, right? Uh, again, he is seeking pleasure. And one of the things that you they would use back then to seek that was wine, right? And so he's drinking and imbibing and kind of and kind of noting his his responses, okay? Again, very purposeful. And then he said, and how I could and how to take hold of folly, how to seize it. Again, folly is the Hebrew word sikluk, and it is found in Ecclesiastes chapter one, verse seventeen. It's almost as if he's kind of underscoring, again, his purpose and intent like he did in chapter one, because he's using the same phrases, the same words here to underscore his method. <clears throat> then we have until I see what good there is for the sons of men to do under heaven the few years of their lives. We recognize this word. This word is tov. This occurs in the first verse of chapter 2. I'm sorry, chapter 1. Once more, this is the same word that occurs in the first verse. Recall that this, is a used to de this word is used to describe the quality of a thing or an activity. In other words, is this thing good? Right? Is it good? So, based upon these particular things, Kohaleth is going to go through each of these things and see whether or not these things are worthwhile to pursue as one's own existence. And we see the, these activities detailed within chapter four, uh, chapter two, verse four onward. First, we have um, the detail that his works are great, and he gives details of these works in verse four. He says, I enlarged my works. He made his works great. So he put, he put his whole heart into, or shall I say his, his servants did, right? So do this, do that, build this, build that, and, and, and let's see whether or not enjoyment is the goal here. So he, we have the building and making phase from verses four to six. I enlarged my works. I built houses for myself. I planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks for myself. I planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made ponds of water for myself. Notice that phrase, for myself. I did this for me, okay? In which to irrigate in forest of growing trees. So he built and made things for himself with the purpose of his own pleasure. Then we have the purchasing phase. He says, I, I bought male and female slaves, that is indentured servants. And I had home-born indentured servants. So not only did I buy them, but I also had servants born to me, right? For the for myself, right? I had also possessed flocks and herds larger than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. So 
Again, flocks and herds was an example of prosperity. That's what people look to, to see whether or not you were wealthy. And he had, he had a whole bunch of them for himself, right? Then he had the collecting phase, verse 8. Also, I collected for myself silver and gold and treasures of kings and provinces, and I provided for myself. Notice this phrase here. This, where this phrase occurs about seven times in this text. For myself, male and female singers. So he had singers. And the pleasures of men, many concubines, right? And we talked about that when we looked at Solomon's life. He had about a thousand of them. Okay. So there was, so there was, there was nothing left to chance here. He builded, he purchased, he collected, and all for the purposes of of himself stimulating his body with wine for pleasure so we have the physiological uh, uh aspect of pleasure we have uh, uh uh the building part of pleasure we have the collecting part of pleasure we have the the purchasing part i mean what else is there verse ch chapter 2 verse 9 he writes this then i became great and increased more than all the men who preceded me in Jerusalem. My wisdom stood with, my wisdom stood by me. As a result of these actions, he was magnified in all the kings mentioned in Jerusalem. And he keeps in mind, so that we won't get lost in the details, that he did this by his wisdom. He's using his activities and comparing his activities to the wisdom that he has he has, essentially, that he received from God. Okay? Then we read this in verse 10 of Ecclesiastes. All that my eyes desired, I did not refuse them. I did not withhold my heart, that word is love again, from any pleasure. For my heart was pleased because of all of my labor, and this was the reward for my labor. All my eyes desire, I did not refuse them. It is important to note that Koaleth saw, the, um, what he saw, he did not deny that. I want this, I want that, I want that, I want this. Let's build this, let's build that. Let's collect this, let's collect that. Now, if Solomon came to this conclusion according to him actually you know what i will i will i will set that statement aside for later i'm going to i'm not going to make that point yet anyway, let's go on to verse 10 again the hebrew word lev is used here this is an activity of the mind this is talking about perspective and outlook It's not necessarily about the accumulation of goods more than it is about one's purpose of why they're here. The mental focus and the intentionality, the cognitive activity of the mind is what Solomon is after. He says, I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure. Let's talk about these words here. Koholeth used the Hebrew word translated pleasure, simcha, to discuss the outcome. The word pleased in this text in verse 10 is the Hebrew word sameach, which is related to simcha. Koholeth confesses that there's some satisfaction and what he achieved. He mentions this in verse 10. There is one, there is some. For instance, if I were to purchase a new car, I'd be very pleased about that. If I were, if we were, if you were to purchase a house or something like that, you would be pleased about that. If you were to uh, build and establish a garden, there is some sort of satisfaction that is associated with that particular work. Kohalath mentioned that this is the reward or portion for all the work. That's true. 
as he mentions in verse 10. This is the reward for my labor, right? The pleasure of the mind. Hey, yeah, I really accomplished something. Yeah, yeah, this is nice, right? Again, the word labor in verse 10 is halak, okay? Or portion here for all the work, all right? Okay, I'm gonna skip that. It says, thus I considered all my activities in verse 11. Now he comes to this, now he comes to the, 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 uh, uh, the downside here. Thus I considered all my activities with which my hands had done and the labor which I had exerted. And behold, all was vanity and a striving after the wind and there was no profit under the sun. So why would uh, Solomon come to this conclusion after he basically just admitted that, yeah, there's some reward for your labor? The Hebrew word for activities here and the labor that is exerted is ma'as. We've seen this word here. It is found in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 3, and 2, verse 10. Okay. What advantage does man have in all of his activity? right and in which he does under the sun right and to 10. then he says behold all of this is vanity and a striving after the wind koaleth uses the word in the hebrew to get the congregation to focus on his statement there is a temporal satisfaction to the work or the labor that is required that receives pleasure. However, when it comes to using this as how to live or how to guide ourselves, how to direct ourselves, what our existence is, we will come up short. As a matter of fact, he kind of underscores this in uh, when he talks a little bit further in chapter 2, I will read this here. I'll start at verse 18. Okay. He says this in chapter 2, verse 18 and following. He says, thus I hated all the fruit of my labor for which I had labored under the sun, for I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be a wise man or a fool, yet he will have control over all of the fruit of my labor, which I had labored by acting wisely under the sun. So it doesn't make sense to live for pleasure and to build all these things because if I, first of all, you're going to die, right? Second of all, you're going to pass them on to a person who may not even be wise in how they use it, right? It'll be a, it'll be a useless endeavor. Because of this, he points us to behold, look, focus. All of it is useless. It is a breath. It is a vapor. It is here and gone. A striving after the wind and a no profit under the sun. There's no advantage to living for pleasure, for pleasure's sake. There's no advantage. The Hebrew word for profit, again, is yitron. Examining all of these things that he mentioned, the fruit trees that he planted, the ponds and lakes, even the concubines that he had, the, the singers, the male and female indentured servants, all of those things that he mentions from verse 4 onward. Pursuing pleasure for himself, he realizes that there's no advantage of it at all. It doesn't profit him anything. Not to mention the fact that everything has a shelf life. You know what I'm saying? You know, cars break down, right? Houses dilapidate, 
right? Things, things corrode. The second law of thermodynamics is in play all the time, right? If we live for the sake of ourselves and for the accumulation of goods for the sake of our own pleasure, eventually we won't feel pleasurable about them anymore. So this brings us to the third question. Should we just walk around in a funeral dirge all the time? <laughs> no. Again, this word semcha is the word for pleasure. This word occurs in the book of Ecclesiastes eight times. So we will see this word periodically throughout the book of Ecclesiastes. And there are two scriptures that I think would be interesting to focus on in light of our text here. Let's go to uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Verse 19 to 20. I call this the silver lining portion because after you, you essentially get beat up all throughout this, uh, all throughout, uh, this text, uh, Koheleth offers some silver linings throughout uh, this text. Uh, throughout the, the dark clouds of this discourse. He says this, he says, here I here, uh, um, I'll start at verse 18. Here's what I see, I've seen to be good and fitting, to eat, to drink, and enjoy oneself and all one's labor, which he toils under the sun during the first few years of life, during the few years of life of God has given him, for this is his reward. Furthermore, as for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth, he's also empowered him, to eat and from them and, re and, receive his, and receive his reward and rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God. For he will not often consider the years of his life because God keeps him occupied with the gladness of his heart. Notice the context here. Labor does have a purpose. That when we work and we attain, uh, you know, uh, monetary, uh, compensation for that work or that labor, that is what, that is ours. And notice how Koalef says that it is the gift of God. That is the proper focus to have concerning pleasure. Not that you live for pleasure, but that you live for God who gives pleasure to human, humanity by means of labor. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, 2 says this. It's very similar to Ecclesiastes 5. There is futility which is done on the earth. That is, there are righteous men to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked. On the other hand, there are evil men to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. So I say this too is useless or futility. So I commend pleasure. I commended pleasure. Same word here, simcha. In this case, Solomon is commending it. For there's nothing good for a man under the sun except to eat, drink, and be merry. And this will stand by him in his toils throughout the days of his life, which God has given him under the sun. Right? In this context... Solomon writes, in comparison to the pain and the toil, the hardship that comes under the sun, pleasure is kind of kind of helps with that. It assists us to have good times. To eat, drink, and be play and be and be and be uh, uh, satisfied with that. And then lastly, I'll throw this out here. Ecclesiastes 9, 7, Koheleth says, Go then, eat your bread in happiness, Simcha, and drink your wine with a cheerful heart, for God has already approved your works. Right? So there is a place for pleasure. But it needs to be properly understood that the perspective is that you don't live for pleasure itself. Or we ought not to live for pleasure itself itself that if we have an outlook that we are we are trying to pursue things to feel good to avoid pain that is a pro that is an improper 
irrational perspective. In other words, don't be a hedonist, right? So what does the following statement about laughter mean? The term laughter ought to be translated enjoyment in the context of pursuing pleasure for its own self. This is the perception, the perception looking at coalesce over all activities. Again, what was the activity and why did he come to these conclusions? Well, his activity was observed with wisdom. That is wisdom from God. There is no other wisdom, according to Kohalath. It reveals that there's a short-term satisfaction to these activities, but pursuing pleasure for the sake of pleasure is irrational. It is unrealistic. It is not living in reality. And it is a foolish, useless pursuit. Remember, this only hurts those who have this worldview. It doesn't hurt those who don't. Does Kovalev believe that pleasure is bad? Because I've heard this before too. Well, the answer to this is no. Kovalev is convinced the proper outlook concerning pleasure is what's needed. It's not pleasure for the sake of itself. God has given us enjoyment as a gift for our labor. And we should be content with that and not pursue pleasure in and of itself. Kohalath informs his audience in chapter, chapter 2, verse 11, that all the activities that he completed for the sake of are, are all the activities that he completed for the sake of pleasure itself. Using the wisdom he had, he concluded that the, suit, that the pursuit of pleasure, that consistent satisfaction for the sake of itself, was useless and a profitless enterprise. Of course. We will continue our study in Ecclesiastes. Again, we're not done with chapter 2. We will continue uh, uh, underscoring and looking at Coalesce's observations of our, our perspective under the sun next week. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for Coalesce's observations that to pursue pleasure in and of itself is useless. It's, it's, it's not even real. But to acknowledge that you have given these things to us to enjoy, to comfort uh, us during uh, times of toil. Um, um, those, those things we, we do acknowledge come from you and we thank you for them. We pray God that we would continue to have our worldview renewed, that we would see things as they are, that pleasure is not a bad thing when pursued in the right outlook and in the right perspective. We thank you so much, Lord, for it's in your son's name. Amen.